Most people facing the death penalty don't pick their lawyer. Uh, they may be fortunate to have a lawyer who is a caring, competent, uh, hardworking person with enough of a caseload or reasonable workload that they can provide the representation that's required in a death penalty case. On the other hand, a poor person accused of a crime involving the death penalty may be assigned a lawyer who's completely incompetent, uh, who has 300 or 400 cases and can't possibly spend the time that's required to defend a capital case. They may be assigned a lawyer who doesn't know the law regarding capital punishment, so that law might as well not exist for this particular client. So we'll take a look at the quality of representation provided to people uh, in death penalty cases. Uh, because often, the lawyer assigned to a case is the determining factor on whether somebody gets the death penalty or not. Uh, some states have capital defender offices. Uh, Colorado has had one for a long time. It has only two or three people usually on death row at any time because that office has been so effective in representing people and preventing imposition of the death penalty in those cases. On the other hand, you have states like Texas and Alabama that have no public defender system even, not to mention a capital defender office. So if you're facing the death penalty in one of those states, and there are a number of them all across the country, uh, it may be that the lawyer is a lawyer from private practice. Uh, it may be the lawyer doesn't have an investigator. Uh, it may be the court doesn't provide funding for experts or other uh, essential uh, aspects of defending a case. Uh, and the result is that person is, to put it mildly, at a tremendous disadvantage uh, facing the death penalty. Uh, a number of examples uh, of this are provided at uh, secondclassjustice.com. Uh, um, in this segment, we're going to look at a few examples uh, and explore the reasons why people uh, can be condemned to die despite uh, grossly uh, incompetent legal representation. Uh, generally, the right to counsel is determined not before trial. Does this person have a competent lawyer who's going to represent them at the trial? But it's determined after the trial. When the question is raised, looking backwards at the trial, did the person have effective assistance of counsel? And we'll talk about how the court has defined that uh, in a way that makes it possible to say a person was not defined effective assistance of counsel even when it's questionable whether, even when that demonstrably uh, is, is not true. Uh, generally, that's the way. There are some exceptions. There have been lawsuits filed uh, to improve representation in uh, uh, criminal cases by uh, dealing with caseloads or other systemic problems. But for the most part, in capital cases particularly, what we're going to see is an after-the-fact look back at the representation that someone had. And I want to use the case out of Oklahoma of James Fisher uh, as an example. Uh, he was tried in 1983 and represented by a lawyer who not only represented James Fisher, but tried 24 other cases during the month of September. Hard to imagine that one lawyer could try 24 cases. He put on no evidence and said only nine words during the sentencing phase of James Fisher's trial. Uh, the case went to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, which said it was deeply disturbed uh, by the representation that Fisher had received. But nonetheless, it wasn't disturbed enough uh, that it gave him a new trial. It upheld both the conviction and the death penalty uh, in the case. Uh, many years later, 2002, the United, States Courts of, the United States Court of Appeals finds that the lawyer failed to investigate what was a close case in terms of whether Fisher was actually the person who committed this crime or not, that the lawyer was grossly inept and disloyal to Fisher uh, by uh, the hostility uh, that he showed uh, towards his client and his client's case. So now many years, 1983 the trial, 2002, a United States appellate court is saying Fisher gets a new trial. Uh, 2005, he has his second trial. This time, Fisher gets a lawyer who was drinking heavily uh, and uh, abusing cocaine. Uh, at one point, the lawyer threatened Fisher, actually asked the deputies to take off the handcuffs so he and Fisher could have a fist fight. Uh, this is about as bad as it gets in attorney-client uh, relations. Uh, no investigation whatsoever. Fisher is sentenced to death yet again. 
2009, this time the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals says, no, this was ineffective lawyering, ineffective at the guilt phase, and the court said Fisher was prejudiced because the prosecution's case was not very strong. In other words, Fisher now, in 2009, having been sentenced to death, has spent over 20 years, most of it on death row, and there's never been a constitutional determination of whether he's actually guilty of the crime or not. Because his first lawyer did nothing for him and his second lawyer did nothing for him. He did not have a, a, a fighting chance of presenting his case and contesting the government's case at either one of these trials. In 2010, the prosecution agrees that Fisher can be released only if he will admit guilt and agree to be banished from Oklahoma forever. Uh, if you're James Fisher and you've had the two trials that he's had, the trial where the lawyer only said nine words at the penalty phase, the trial where the lawyer tried to get in a fist fight with him and was drinking and abusing cocaine, um, it's awfully hard to turn that deal down. Uh, we see this in a number of death penalty cases that get reversed where when they come back the prosecution wants to save face but knows it probably can't get a conviction. The defendant wants out but knows there's some risk that they may be convicted again and regardless they're going to stay in jail for some period of time before the new trial so they end up taking this sort of uh, deal uh, where they agree to plead guilty, sometimes uh, pleading guilty while maintaining their innocence uh, in exchange for time served basically uh, and they're set free. Uh, this case is a disgrace. Uh, it's a disgrace that the trial judge didn't stop it at the first trial, that the trial judge didn't stop it at the second trial, and that it took this many years for James Fisher's right to counsel uh, to be uh, vindicated. Uh, but it's not that unusual. Uh, Gregory Wilson, sentenced to death uh, in Kentucky, was represented by a lawyer who practiced out of his home. Um, you may say a lawyer could practice out of his home, although this was back in the days before uh, laptop computers and the kind of technological uh, advantages we have today that make it possible for a lawyer to practice out of his or her home. Uh, in this case, uh, the lawyer's home had a big Budweiser beer sign uh, up on the wall uh, in the living room. Uh, Wilson found out <coughs> Wilson found out that just a short time before the police had gone to this office or home of the lawyer and had taken up the floor in the living room and taken out eight bags of stolen property. But what really was the final straw for Gregory Wilson was when he called the telephone number the lawyer gave him and they answered Kelly's Keg. Uh, Kelly's Keg is a bar right across the street uh, from the Kenton County Courthouse in Kentucky where Gregory Wilson was tried. And it actually worked. I mean, if you call the number for Kelly's keg, the bartender would answer and often summon the lawyer, William Hagdorn, uh, to the phone. Uh, but unfortunately, he may not remember that call the next day. When Wilson gets to court, he says to the judge, Your Honor, I want a new lawyer. I mean, I'm facing the death penalty. I'm from Detroit, I'm in Kentucky, I'm a black man facing the death penalty in a place where I don't know anybody and I need a real lawyer. The judge says, well, Mr. Wilson, you can have any lawyer you want, but this is your court appointed lawyer, Mr. Hagdorn. Uh, so if you want to bring in another lawyer, of course, Wilson had no ability to bring in another lawyer. Uh, and as a result, he went to trial uh, with Mr. Hagdorn as his lawyer. Uh, he was, it was a somewhat farcical trial. He was sentenced to death. Uh, and in the review process later, the courts rejected his claim that he had not been adequately represented, saying that Wilson had failed to cooperate with Mr. Hagdorn. Of course, he was trying to get Mr. Hagdorn replaced during all that time. The question you ask of this case is, how does a person like Gregory Wilson enforce the right to counsel? The most fundamental right a person accused of a crime or facing the death penalty has. What do you do when the lawyer is incompetent? You can tell the lawyer is incompetent, but this is the judge, the lawyer the judge gave you. Uh, and so here we see an example of when the most fundamental right a person has is actually uh, unenforceable, even though it's hard to imagine what else Gregory Wilson could have done.
than what he did in trying to get a new lawyer. Uh, Jeffrey Leonard was tried by a lawyer who knew so little about him that he was tried under the name James Slaughter. His lawyer didn't even know his client's name. Uh, he had used this James Slaughter as an alias uh, and had been arrested under that name. Uh, the lawyer didn't know that he was brain damaged. Uh, the lawyer did not know a whole lot, or didn't know anything actually, about his client. And when the case was being heard and the lawyer testified about his experience, he claimed that he had been a prosecutor in New York and that he had tried other death penalty cases. Turned out those were not true. Uh, he later resigned from the bar in a deal uh, because uh, of his misrepresentations. But the courts, all the way through the state and federal courts, upheld the death sentence for Jeffrey Leonard. He was spared execution only because the governor of Kentucky, Ernie Fletcher, uh, commuted his sentence uh, when, when he left office. Uh, another example is Hollywood. Uh, IQ in the low 60s, this is an intellectually disabled person uh, who is tried in Alabama and sentenced to death. And it turns out that the lawyers representing him, local lawyers, never bothered to go to the school where Hollywood had been in special education classes. The special education classes were held in the basement of the school where the electricity often didn't work. It also flooded every time it rained. Uh, and it was called by the other students the mole hole. And Hollywood was one of the moles. Uh, this would have probably been critical evidence if the jury had only heard it, uh, that he had an IQ in the low 60s, that he had been in special education, whatever one can say uh, about someone faking mental illness, you can't fake uh, an IQ in the 60s at the time you're in grade school uh, in anticipation that many, many years later you might face the death penalty. Uh, inadequate representation, nevertheless, Alabama courts held that the lawyers made a reasonable decision not to investigate uh, and go to the school and talk to the teachers and find out what was right there in town uh, and uh, that that was a reasonable decision Alabama executed Hollywood uh, in 1960. There are many other examples. I mean, if you go to Texas, uh, three death penalty cases in which the lawyer slept during the trial. Uh, judges presiding over cases where the lawyer representing the person facing the death penalty is asleep, even snoring in some cases. One of the judges was asked by a, a journalist, how can you preside over a case where the defense lawyer is asleep uh, in trying the case. And the judge said, well, the Constitution guarantees you a lawyer, uh, but it doesn't guarantee you that the lawyer has to be awake. Uh, and so uh, Calvin Burdine, uh, uh, two other people sentenced to death in Calvin Burdine's case, the case goes to the United States Court of Appeals and uh, the state of Texas argues that uh, even though the lawyer, Joe Cannon, who also slept in another death penalty case and was an older lawyer who often slept after lunch when he tried cases, and yet the judges in Houston continued to appoint him to case after case. Texas made the argument that, well, uh, this was not inadequate lawyering or ineffective lawyering because, after all, the court had upheld cases where the lawyers were under the influence of alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, even a case where a lawyer had Alzheimer's. Uh, but the court decided that a sleeping lawyer was unconscious and so was therefore unlike the alcoholically impaired lawyer or the drug impaired lawyer uh, and found that uh, Burdine was entitled uh, to a new, new trial. Another Cannon uh, client, another person represented by uh, Joe Frank Cannon, uh, Carl Johnson, was executed by the state of Texas and George McFarlane, who was represented by uh, John Benn, another lawyer who actually snored uh, during the trial, uh, is, is still on death row. Uh, in Texas. Another lawyer in Texas is Jerome Gudnich who practices in Houston and who in three different death penalty cases has missed the deadline for filing a federal habeas corpus action. So about as basic a responsibility as a lawyer has in any kind of case, whether it's an automobile negligence case or any other kind of case, file within the deadline, file within the statute of limitations. He missed it not once, you would have thought that would have been enough to suspend him from practice, not twice, uh, but three times. And yet the State Bar of Texas did nothing. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals did absolutely nothing. The trial judges in Houston uh, 
did nothing. In fact, he's still being appointed uh, to criminal cases, including capital cases in Texas today. You're not very lucky if you get this guy as your lawyer. Uh, not very lucky at all, uh, and yet nothing has been done despite what really should be a basis for some disciplinary action uh, by the bar in terms of missing the statute of limitations. How can it be uh, that uh, this happens uh, in cases? Well, the Supreme Court held 1942 in a case called Glasser versus United States that the right to counsel is too fundamental and absolute for courts to indulge in nice calculations as to the amount of prejudice from its denial. In other words, if somebody's denied their right to a lawyer, that's so fundamental. We can't get into whether the case would have come out the same way or not. We've got to give them a new trial. The court changed its mind uh, and decided actually courts could make a fairly rough calculation of what difference it made uh, in the case of Strickland versus Washington in 1984. This was a death penalty case. David Washington was sentenced to death in Florida and had raised the fact that his lawyer had done virtually nothing to prepare for the penalty phase of his case. Uh, the Supreme Court said that a lawyer is not ineffective if the judges can conclude after looking at the case that it didn't make any difference, that the lawyer's incompetence didn't make any difference. The court asked this question, is there a reasonable probability that but for the lawyer's performance, the deficient performance, the result would be different. In other words, do the acts and omissions of the lawyer undermine confidence in the outcome of the case? Uh, this is the uh, prejudice prong, uh, Strickland uh, versus Washington. There are two parts of it. I'm going to take the prejudice part first because this is where the court said uh, that judges can decide, in other words, even though a lawyer may be incompetent, a judge can say there was no violation of the right to counsel because the judge concludes that the case would come out the same way even if the person had been represented by a competent counsel. Of course, it's very hard for judges to know that. Uh, they weren't there at the trial. Uh, they didn't hear the witnesses. Uh, they weren't sitting in the jury, and they don't know how the jury assessed the case. And yet every day, courts decide to uphold cases where people have had deficient legal representation uh, on the basis that there's not a substantial probability that but for the representation the person received, uh, they would have gotten the death penalty. Uh, so even though courts are saying lawyers are not, quote, ineffective legally, they're not saying, or the, the lawyer can still be incompetent, but not legally ineffective. And so as a result, it's a way in which courts can paper over the poor quality of representation uh, that happens in many cases, capital uh, and non-capital as well. The other part of the test is, was the performance of the lawyer deficient? And the court has said that's measured by what are prevailing uh, professional norms. Did the lawyer's representation meet whatever the sort of standard of care in the legal profession is for representing somebody in a death penalty case. Now that would be uh, uh, an objective assessment, but the court added a couple of three things to make it very difficult to conclude uh, uh, that the lawyer's performance uh, fell below this standard. Uh, first of all, the court said judicial review is going to be highly deferential. In other words, the judges are not to second guess lawyers as a general matter. Uh, the courts are to indulge a strong presumption that the lawyer rendered adequate assistance. In other words, regardless of whether the lawyer did or not, the courts are going to presume that the lawyer was adequate and made all significant decisions based upon professional judgment. The lawyer may have been completely clueless, but the Supreme Court says we'll presume that any decision not to call a witness, not to do an investigation, not to do whatever, was a professional decision and tactical decisions or strategic choices made after thorough investigation, which may or may not be an issue in some cases, are virtually unchallengeable. So what the court is basically doing here is making it fairly hard for a court considering a claim of ineffective lawyering uh, to find the lawyer uh, deficient in the performance because of these presumptions, although they can be overcome, and they are, uh, 
from time to time in cases. Uh, but then the court can also decide, as I talked about a moment ago, uh, that it didn't have an effect on the outcome. It would all been the same, uh, and there we'd be. Well, uh, Justice Marshall dissents. Uh, he says this standard is so malleable, it will either have no grip at all or there will be all kind of variations. In other words, there won't really be a standard of representation uh, for people uh, in, in these cases. Uh, and he also says this presumption, all these presumptions, put a very heavy burden of persuasion on the person who's been convicted or sentenced to death uh, and says that once you show, back to what the court had said in Glasser, once a determination is made that the lawyer's performance was deficient, then that should be the end. The court shouldn't indulge in the speculation about whether or not it made a difference. Let me take one case to just illustrate uh, what, what happens here. The, the, the judicial rulings on denial of counsel in the state courts are made by elected judges, uh, often the very same judges uh, who appointed the lawyer in the first instance, not always, but, but often the case, uh, and then reviewed on habeas corpus by the federal courts, life tenure judges, but they can set aside a conviction only if they conclude that the decision of the state court, which is where almost all these cases come from, was an unreasonable application of Strickland versus Washington or was contrary to Strickland versus Washington. Let's take a look at Robert Holsey's case. Um, this was a uh, man sentenced to death in Georgia. Turns out that his lead defense lawyer uh, drank a quart of vodka every night during the trial because he was getting ready to be indicted and ultimately disbarred uh, and ultimately convicted uh, for uh, stealing client funds. The lawyer said he probably shouldn't been allowed to represent anybody uh, during this time period. Uh, he didn't present this man as intellectually disabled, but no evidence was presented about that. Uh, he had been subject to, this is from Judge Barquette's dissent, that he was subject to abuse that was so severe, so frequent, and so notorious that his neighbors called his childhood home the torture chamber. All this evidence not presented by this lawyer who's drinking a quart of vodka every day during a capital trial. Uh, Georgia trial judge says no one can seriously believe that Holsley received the constitutional guarantee of the right to counsel. Seems pretty obvious. Uh, but the Georgia Supreme Court says, well, there's no substantial probability that the case would have come out differently. That even if he had had a sober lawyer, even if he had had a lawyer to put on all this evidence about his mental limitations, about the abuse he received as a child, uh, we, the Georgia Supreme Court justices, don't think it would have come out any differently. And the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit says, well, we defer to the Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, it's not an unreasonable application of Strickland versus Washington because fair-minded jurists can disagree uh, with regard to it. Uh, so, in other words, even though the trial judge who saw the witnesses and heard about this found that uh, violation of the right to counsel, the Georgia Supreme Court didn't make any finding that the lawyer who was on vodka and about to be indicted was competent. They just find that it wouldn't have made any difference if he had had uh, another lawyer in his case. So, just as James Fisher uh, would probably be denied under the law as it is today if, the, if you had this deference that was applied in Holsey's case, uh, Robert Holsey probably would have received a new trial if his case had been before the federal courts back at the time Fisher's case was before the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. In other words, when these cases came before the federal courts, one was when the law did not require deference to state court findings, that's Fisher and he got a new trial, and he's a free man today. Holsley's comes before the court uh, when the courts do have to defer, the federal courts, to the state courts. And because of this restraint, because of this deference, he loses. So timing is everything. There are going to be a lot of Robert Holsley's. A lot of people who are, and there are a lot, who are sentenced to death, who the state courts say, well, the lawyer may not have been great, but we don't think it would have made a difference. Uh, and the federal courts then are going to apply uh, this deferential standard of review. 
basically as Justice Marshall predicted in his dissent in Strickland. Uh, this standard has turned out to be so malleable uh, that it's an eye of the beholder standard. Some judges will look at a lawyer's performance and say this was deficient, it affected the outcome, the person's entitled to a new trial. Another judge will look at the same set of facts and say we don't think it made any difference. And if you're a federal judge, you can even say, well, we may not agree with the state court decision. We may not agree with the Georgia Supreme Court, but it's not unreasonable because fair-minded judges can disagree. And if fair-minded judges can disagree, then we're going to uh, let the state courts decide. The reason this is so important, and we'll talk about judges at another time, uh, is because the state court judges are elected. Uh, and very often the decision making in the state courts is influenced, uh, as Justice Stevens has recognized, as Justice Sotomayor has recognized, uh, by the political pressure that's often present uh, when you have elected judges deciding cases. The federal judges, uh, life tenure judges, have a little more independence. Um, can prejudice be presumed? Uh, this is an interesting case that was decided the same day that the Washington or Strickland versus Washington case was decided. A man named Harrison Cronick uh, is the government spends four and a half, the United States government spends four and a half years getting his case ready for trial. Uh, it's, he's charged with 13 counts of check kiting, uh, and the case involves thousands of documents about how this check kiting scheme worked. Uh, and he's given a real estate lawyer who had never tried a case 25 days before trial. Look at this, the government spent four and a half years getting ready and his lawyer has 25 days to get ready for trial. The lower court looked at this and said, well, I mean, of course, this couldn't possibly be, a uh, lawyer couldn't possibly represent somebody in this situation. Uh, Supreme Court unanimously reversed and said, we are not going to presume uh, prejudice uh, in this case. Uh, we are going to uh, require that the court look at it under the Washington versus Strickland standard. In other words, we're going to look at the lawyer's performance. Was it a deficient performance? And secondly, uh, was there any prejudice as a result? Uh, Chronic's case was sent back to the lower court. It actually found that even under the Strickland standard, uh, he was ineffective. The lawyer was ineffective. Uh, he was given a new trial. Uh, he was convicted at the new trial, but on appeal, the court said there wasn't even sufficient evidence uh, to convict him, and his double jeopardy principles uh, prevented him from being tried again. Uh, again, that case might not come out the same way uh, today. Uh, but of course, this is a case out of the United States, uh, prosecuted by the United States, so it's not quite the same uh, as, the, as the state cases that are reviewed. Uh, on habeas corpus. Um, for the most part, uh, the denial, the court's going to make clear, or did make clear in a number of cases after this, that very seldom will prejudice be presumed. In the Calvin Burdine case, which I mentioned, where the lawyer slept during the trial, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, sitting with the whole court, held that there they would presume prejudice because a lawyer who was asleep was basically absent from the trial. And a sleeping lawyer is really no lawyer at all, and therefore we will presume prejudice. Of course, that's an extraordinary kind of case. That's not your typical case where there's a sleeping lawyer. There may be a very bad lawyer, but usually the lawyers can manage to stay awake during the trial. Uh, so generally the cases are going to be looked at under Strickland. Again, it's going to be very much the courts that look at it, uh, the political pressures that come to bear, the very deferential standard of assessing whether or not the lawyer's performance was deficient or not. And then finally, the court's decision about is there a substantial probability? Do we think it made a difference, a substantial probability that it affected the outcome? As a result, many people who receive inadequate representation uh, are not going to have their cases set aside uh, and are going to be executed. Of course, there are going to be some cases, and there were cases decided uh, by the United States Supreme Court, uh, the Williams case out of Virginia, Terry Williams, where the court held that there was ineffective representation. The Wiggins case out of Maryland, again, where the court found ineffective representation. But, and, and, and the uh, Rompilla case, Rompilla versus Beard, where again the United States Supreme Court found ineffective representation. Uh, 
But against those cases, you find case after case, including a number of cases where the Supreme Court has just granted uh, review of a case and reversed a grant of ineffective assistance of counsel. And we see many courts in the country where it's almost impossible to prevent, to, excuse me, to prevail on a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel. What does this mean going forward? It means that people facing the death penalty may have the good fortune to have good lawyers, well-trained lawyers, capable lawyers, uh, but they may also not. And if they don't, uh, there may be no relief for them.